Welcome to Nuclear Chemistry Part 1. This will have a, um, a brief introduction and a review of what we've learned about the nuclear structure of atoms. Let's get started. All right, here we have three symbols um, for various isotopes of carbon. So this is a quick review. This would be a great place to just um, pause and answer all the questions and check in to see where you are with um, your knowledge of nuclear structure. Right? So as we look at carbon-12, we would see that it has six protons and it would have six neutrons, right? We found the neutrons because remember that this top value here, right? That's the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. And then here we have Z. And I think I've given away the answers already to the later questions, right? So carbon-13, of course, has six protons as well, but has seven neutrons. And then, of course, carbon-14 also has six protons, but now it has eight neutrons, right? So what's the same about all these isotopes, right? It's definitely, right, it's the number of protons, right? What's different about each of these isotopes, right? The number of neutrons. All right. So what does the subscript, right? The superscript, or excuse me, subscripted six, right? That represents the number of protons. And we remember that the symbol there is Z, right? For the number of protons. And then, Right? The superscripted 12, 13, 14, that represents the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. And we remember that that symbol is A, right? Oh, let's go through the names, right? So this would be the mass number, which makes sense because it's the protons and the neutrons that create the mass of an atom. And then for completion, right, the symbol Z is described as the atomic number, which also makes sense because we see that the identity of an atom is determined by the number of protons. All right, so that's enough of a quick review. Now let's um, see what happens when we have um, radioisotopes. So what does that mean? So a radioisotope is basically, those are unstable isotopes. So some isotopes are stable, but others are not. And so basically, it's when we have too many protons, right, or neutrons. That creates an unstable nucleus. And so that is going to create a condition where radioactive decay occurs. The nucleus of the radioactive isotope undergoes a natural process to become more, s more stable. And so how does the nucleus become more stable? It has to release subatomic particles um, and or um, light or high energy electromagnetic radiation, right? And or light. And light the fancy name for light is electromagnetic radiation. Okay, so it's one thing it's important that um, we understand that radioactivity is just part of being on Earth, right? We have, we're all exposed to background radiation every day, and this is the radiation that occurs from natural sources. And then depending on what's going on in our life and where we live, there are artificial sources as well. So let's look at um, the common exposure from living on planet Earth. All right, so look at all the natural sources, right? Cosmic rays penetrating through our, our atmosphere, um, terrestrial radiation from rocks and buildings, um, inside our body, we have naturally occurring isotopes, potassium and radium, and then there's radon in the air, right? So being alive on Earth, we are going to be exposed to 
approximately 294 millirems per year. We'll talk about these units in a future tutorial. Now, where do the artificial sources come from? Right? Well, if we, um, oops, we got a typo there. If we have a medical x-ray or we're receiving a nuclear medicine treatment, um, some consumer products, um, television monitors and screens, um, smoke detectors, if we're close to a nuclear power plant, notice the contribution there, and then all other sources. So now these two, you know, it depends on what's going on in our life. We may or may not be getting x-rays or receiving nuclear medicine treatments. Look at the dose there. That is huge, right? So three, so that's 53 millirem per year right there. So what do we notice? We notice that the natural sources of radiation are 80 to 96 percent of total exposure. And the man-made, right, if we ignore this, we're down to um, 12 millirem and only 4% of exposure. So I think that um, ignorance and fear um, can be common bedfellows. And I think some of the fear associated with nuclear chemistry and nuclear energy is related to not understanding exactly what's going on. So I think it's really helpful to look at the, um, where we get our exposures so we can keep everything in um, perspective. And now we'll um, do an, an introduction to the different types of radiation. All right, so let's imagine that we have a lead box and it um, contains a variety of radioactive sources. And then we align the beam to narrow it. And then we um, allow the beam to travel through a magnetic field, right? And so what do we notice? We notice that the alpha rays are attracted to the negative plate the gamma rays are not affected by the magnetic field, and the beta rays are attracted to the positive plate. So this is going to help us understand um, the electromagnetic aspects of radioactive decay. So here's a table that summarizes. So we'll start here, and this will be our original element. All right, and so we'll just um, it could be any element, so I'll just be generic here. So, um, just for simplicity, I'll use the same symbols. Um, it would be pretty uncommon that a single element would have all of these different, or isotopes would have all of these different forms of decay, but it will, um, it'll, I think it will be instructive, all right? So, if our original element is an alpha emitter, Basically, what it's releasing is a helium nucleus, right? So the helium nucleus can be described as an out with an alpha symbol. And remember that it is a helium nucleus. So um, it would have charge. And that's the positive charge that's attracted to the negative plate. Okay. And then we will get a new element, right? So because of the helium nucleus, right, has a mass number of four and an atomic number of two. So think about your mass balance, right? Chemical reactions, even nuclear reactions, obey the conservation of mass. So over here, we will get a daughter. And I think it's very interesting about the feminine qualities. And so what will happen to our daughter, right? Well, the original nucleus had Z protons, and two were lost in the alpha particle, Z minus two. And then the original mass number was A, but now we've lost, right, two protons and two neutrons from our alpha particle, so we would subtract four. And so this would be the isotope of the daughter product. Now we'll look at the original element again, but this time we'll see it as a beta emitter. So beta, the symbol there can be, there will be, um, there's no change of mass, 
but the minus sign will help us understand beta. That, right? So what do we want to do here? We're going to lose a minus 1. So when we look at the daughter, we say the parent was originally a z, and now we're going to lose a minus 1. And notice that the mass number doesn't change. And we will explore exactly what's happening in a subsequent tutorial. So we'll just take it one step at a time. And so we could rewrite this simplifying. Okay. So basically what happens here, right, is that the nucleus gained a proton. So here we have a neutron becoming a proton plus a beta particle. I guess I'll give you that right now. Okay, a positron emitter is basically the opposite of a beta emitter. And so we use the same beta symbol, but now we put the plus one. So then the symbol is exactly like the previous one, except we switch the sign. So now when we look at our daughter, the mass number stays the same. However, here we're emitting a positron, positive charge. Think about charge balance and mass balance. So here the proton becomes a neutron, and then to balance the charge, we would have to have the positron. And so what happens here is we would have z minus 1. So notice the symbol there. So there's our daughter, one um, proton less. And then the last form that we're going to look at, there, there is electron capture, um, but we'll, we don't need to worry about that one. We will look at gamma emitters. And what happens here is that there becomes an M, right? So what does this M stand for? This M stands for metastable, right? Not quite stable. And what happens here is that we have a nucleus in a high energy state. And so it's not going to release any particles what happens is it was a gamma ray, right? High energy light. So the excited or high energy nuclear state will release energy as a gamma ray. And so notice then that the daughter um, is the exact same element. It's just now, right, there's no more meta, right? It's lower in energy. Um, it's also important to note that when we do have alpha, beta, or positron decay, in addition to releasing these particles, there may be a release of a gamma ray as well to um, vent off additional energy to help stabilize the daughter or the product. Um, so really briefly, we will talk about electromagnetic radiation in a lot more detail in a future tutorial, but I wanted to introduce the concept here. Right? Here are our gamma rays. Notice that gamma rays, we are looking at very short wavelengths and very high frequency. And so this is the high energy side of the electromagnetic spectrum. And then we see, right, so then x-rays are lower in energy than gamma rays. And then would come UV light, which can give us a sunburn. And then the visible light that we can see. And then comes the infrared and the radio, radio wave and microwave. So then notice what's happening to the wavelength, right? The wavelength is getting longer and longer. And the frequency is getting shorter or lower. All right, so this is our low energy side. Okay, well, this concludes our um, introduction to nuclear chemistry. Please take time now to work a few homework problems to reinforce your understanding.